speeches ever made with Lincoln. something so please turn up the Gettysburg address make sure your name is on it are there any questions oh what score 20. 20 years. four score yeah so what happened 86 years before that 
Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence, the founding of the country. Did people say the word score a lot in 1863? No! It's just a great way to start to speak. No, I'll do it. Well, I'll answer any question. And I want to do this whole idea that they really tried to make equality and then didn't happen. Alright, turn them off, make sure the name is on them. Yes. Huh? We're going to tomorrow, we're finishing the last two weeks. Why? So, okay. Alright, turn them off. Let's go. Alright, everybody, take out the Gettysburg address. Take that out. Oh, and then I'll answer, I'll answer questions on. Did you like the speech? Isn't that a great speech? Right. All right. Everybody, take out the Gettysburg Address. All right, we're going to watch the last little bit of Universe of Battle where they talk about the Gettysburg Address. I like that for a couple reasons. They um, talk a little bit about the speech. There's only one picture taken there because the speech was so short. And also, when they actually show, they read the speech and show it, they start with pictures from the battle, and then it goes to the 50th anniversary where veterans of both the Confederate and Union armies came. And there's a film of that. And I just love how they put some of the film, mix it in. Also, one shot of Arlington National Cemetery, which I'll tell you about tomorrow. And so I really enjoy this. I enjoy it so much that I somehow left the pit lock. Left my screen. All right, here we go. This is Eisenhower's farm. It's awesome.
So a couple things about it. Everett spoke for a couple hours, and that was expected in 1863. You're going to go to a speech. It's going to be a speech. They wanted it to be long. And don't forget, they had a heck of a lot longer attention spans than people today. Technology, thank you. But they wanted a long speech. So a short speech was a half hour. That's a short speech in 1863. So when Lincoln got up to gave the speech, people were just starting to get kind of set, you know, get ready to listen to the speech. And he got done, they hadn't even listened. They thought there was just a little bit of preamble, and they're waiting for the rest of the speech, and he was done. They're like, oh, okay. So he really felt like he didn't succeed. And the speech you read here, he rewrote it, and rewrote it, and rewrote it, and then rewrote it one time afterwards. And that was issued to the paper. So we don't know the exact speech, because there's about seven different copies of it. He never did anything without careful preparation. He wrote it. He spent um, weeks writing this speech. He wanted to be short and concise. And one other thing, he was disappointed about that, but he also knew that this short speech would look great in newspapers. That's where people were going to get their information from. He was not talking to that small group there. He was talking to the nation. And I should add one more thing. He also said there will be a day of Thanksgiving for this um, to dedicate the cemetery. Now, there had been informal Thanksgiving ceremonies, which is just a harvest festival in October. You know, they've got the harvest before winter comes, which is it's tradition. And he moved the Thanksgiving ceremony here, announced it. And so in honor of that and also his reelection, they did another one. And then after he died, they did another one. And they started doing it more and more on that third Thursday after the first Monday in November. More and more and more. Then in the 1930s, Franklin Roosevelt announced by presidential uh, executive order to move it a week later. And that's why Thanksgiving is in the back. Starts here. And then it moved on. <laughs> they called it Franksgiving for, for uh, Franklin Roosevelt for a while. That was a Democratic newspaper to they criticized. People loved his speech. So just watch. They do a great job. Here are the pictures. And then it's such a good.
I think they do a great job with that. I love the first opening scenes and then that reunion. So, uh, so this was a three day affair in, in July 1913. Big deal. And they had, they had um, camps laid out with the Confederate veterans and Union veterans separate. And they did, they did a reenactment, which is so weird to think about, reenacting a picket's charge with the veterans who are all now quite old. And so they had Confederates marched to last about 100 yards toward, toward Union soldiers who were still behind the very same stone fence by this tall, with a stone wall. And, they, and you had a couple thousand Confederates marched toward a couple thousand Union soldiers there. And some were being pushed in wheelchairs. And they got closer and closer and to about 20 yards away, the Union soldiers just couldn't take it anymore. You know what they did? Not really jumping men, <laughs> men in their 70s, but some did. They came over the fence and did what? <laughs> no. They hugged fingers. The emotion was so overwhelming. And they didn't like that they reenacted it, which is just such a weird thing to do, I think. But it, a fitting end to that. Really trying to symbolize that the country is together. Not completely, but together. Now, let's look at the questions. I want you to answer these questions, but I really want to go through them. Because they all led to that last question. You know, Lincoln's trying to lay out why this hell, why this sacrifice was worth it. So, what documents are you referring to? Declaration of Independence. Declaration of Independence. And that's the founding document of the United States of America. But who else considered it their founding document? The Confederates did too. They acted like we're fighting for the same causes and you've gone away from the founding fathers. That's why we had to leave the country. And Lincoln's laying claim to it. We're representing the founding fathers, not you. Is he being fully gen? Who wrote the Declaration of Independence? Who was the main author, do you remember? A slaveholder from Virginia, which is seceded. He was hedging a little bit. Still pretty clever. Let's look at the next question. This is a hard one. And it's one of those that doesn't look hard, but it kind of is. Lincoln said the Civil War is testing. If you look at that second sentence, it says, now we are engaged in a great Civil War testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. What is the Civil War testing? What is this testing? Yeah. Whether or not a country based on freedom still exists. Yeah, freedom or, yeah. I said freedom. Yeah. It's not just freedom. Freedom of African Americans still freedom. Exactly right. So we got freedom and equality. That was the biggie. It's equality too. But he said, dedicate, conceived and delivered, dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. It's not just that the nation can survive. Is a country based upon these ideals laid, state, um, laid out by the founding fathers? So in a way, we're finishing their job. They didn't do it in 1776, obviously. We wouldn't have the Civil War. Now we're finishing. So everyone got that. A country based upon equality. Now, you are going to have to answer a short idea on the Gettysburg Address on the final. So we have to make sure we get this, because this lays out the reason for the war. It's not just a geographical locate, geographical spot on a map called the United States. Who cares about that? It's for a higher cause. What task lies ahead then? It is us for the living to be dedicated here to the unfinished work for which they were fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us. What is the great task? Is that? Hmm? Yeah, gotta win. That's the task. We gotta win. The war is not even close to being over. We have to win this war. Or what happens to the nation built upon the fall? The whole thing is gone, and we've let them down. Yeah. Yeah. 
We've let everyone down. We've let every single person from the founding fathers down. Next one. What's the last full measure? Now, it, it implies giving your life, but there's always one scene that gets me about that 1913 reenactment. Every time I see it, it gets me. You know what I'm saying? The guy washing his clothes. You remember that? Lost his arm. And then some weird reporter kind of stands there leering at him. I just thought that he's a reporter. The guy lost his arm. Did he get the last call measure? Think about it for a second. I got hit here. Right? Makes sense, right? That far from dead. I think he could have died from that hit. Why did a bullet or a piece of shrapnel miss by this much? Couldn't it easily hit here or here? A little bit further up? Kill them? Isn't it just pure happenstance that that bullet just happened to go there? Or that piece of shrapnel ripped him apart there? He could have been dead. Did he get the last one? Oh, what side was he? No, not the arm. <laughs> what side was he on the Confederacy or the Union? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Now. Last full measure means you're willing to do that. Yeah, make the sacrifice. Did Lincoln? He clearly didn't believe he did. Now, looking back, though, we kind of know what's going to happen. You know, in 1862, the summer, right, bef right after, um, I'm sorry, right before the battle, second bull run, Lincoln's son died, the gentleman's son. His wife never recovered, ever. And then Lincoln died. As if her, she couldn't function her soul. Heartbreaking for her. He went through that, and we know what's going to happen. Those of us who looked ahead in history. So, here's the biggie then. You notice that's why I have this last question. That's why this is so important. According to Lincoln, what was the reason the United States was fighting this? To do what? Well, to win, but to do what? Hmm? But more than that, just, I'll just unify the nation, even though that's obviously, but what kind of nation? A nation based upon equality, based upon liberty, to finish whose job? And if we don't win, who have we let down? Founding fathers and everybody who died all of Gettysburg and beyond. Now, the reason I want you to reach out for 16, even though I know it's the rest of us do tomorrow, they really tried to give people equal rights. At least men. Skipping still about 49% of the population, but they really tried. And what happened at the end of the Reconstruction? Again. Yeah, Jim Crow laws are going to come, the voting. What's going to happen to voting rights for African Americans in the South, African American men after Reconstruction? By 1900, virtually no blacks in the South could vote. A country based upon equality <coughs> can have it and it can go away, including in the United States. It went away. Remember, I told you in many states women could vote before the Industrial Revolution. That went away. Rights can come and go. It's happening right now. Equality can go away. So is the war over? Depends what the state is. Wars are simply unifying the country. It's over. Country basically, you know, not really count the Dakotas, but other than that, but equality can go away. We can still let the founding fathers down. 
and it's happened right after Reconstruction. When could African Americans in the South vote? 1965. And when could women vote? Montana was 1940. The 19th Amendment was 1920. American Indians have become citizens of the United States until 1929. Rights can go away. And so, equality, a nation based upon liberty, is always a shaky thing. Because it can happen, because it did happen here already. So, could it happen again? Could it? Yeah, it's a very distinct possibility. So, the reason I put down is the war is over. You can still lose a call. We're probably the closest in my lifetime to that happen. So, yeah, this is a we're not really shaky time because it can happen again. It doesn't mean it will. I think it's a great speech. Who, anybody have to do this in elementary school, memorize it, and give it to your class? Anybody? Yep, I did too. Still, I still have a little bit of. I remember being terrified in fourth grade in front of my class doing this. So that's what we're going to do for the rest of the year. Just everyday memorized speeches. I just expect you to know it. Wait till the next assembly. Wouldn't that be fun? All right. So I will ask a question about this. I hope you enjoyed that um, little bit of a video clip. And let's get. Let's go take your notes out. Oh, everybody, let me tell you two things really quick about. No, we're, we're going to just like finish. I think life finish. I believe. All right, so let's go ahead and finish this up. I don't know what. It's just really weird. All right. So. Let's go and finish. We're going to do the election. I got a couple stories to tell. <coughs> Remember, I told you Sherman, Meade. Did we do interior lines of it? I got to draw you a map of the United States. So, Meade and Grant to Richmond. And remember the election of 1864. It's all the election. Wars are politics, it's a political decision to stay in the war. He forgot his computer. So I think I got to the Battle of Wilderness. It's horrible, bloody fight. Did I tell you about how they moved south? They all cheered. They stayed in the fight. I know that seems like a long time ago. Oh, did everything go okay the day I was gone? The video worked okay. The council was came. Do you remember that? Yes. Yeah. I know it's last year. It's stuck. It's last year. <laughs> Double crusted cormorant. There's always a few at the fairgrounds in the summer. No, some are. Some are Montana. There's this bird called a crow. Have you heard of those? All right, so interior lines. After this battle, Grant ordered me to the next road junction to try to get around Lee's army. Lee's army, both. And so I got to draw you a map. I know all of you are thinking, finally, a map, right? This is just, it's a rough map. It's, it's a rough approximation. Do you want to see it? Want to see the United States? It's, this is all free. In. Here's the United States, right? That's out to the Confederacy, right? Here's Richmond, here's Washington, D.C. So let's say the Union Army attacked the Confederates. Yeah. 
<laughs> I'm trying to bounce it into Mr. Watson. <laughs> Thought I did it. I was all excited. So there's a battle, it's a draw. So now the Union Army is going to try to go to the next road junction. So here's the next road junction. It's a race. Who can get there first? Who has the advantage? Because the Confederates can take a straight line. The Union has got to back up a little bit and attack. And that's called interior lines. And that's what happened here. The Confederates marched here where the Union had to backtrack and then attack. And so armies on the defensive always have this advantage. So they can go this way and the armies on the defensive always do. And there's something else. As they begin to advance, two things. Supply lines get longer and longer too for the attackers, always. They always get long. Armies on the offensive always have this problem. Armies on the defensive, if they can survive, they have shorter supply lines. So like, this happened in, in every war. That's part of the reason why Nazi Germany could hold out so long. Their supply lines got longer while the Allies' supply line, or supply, their supply lines got shorter, the Allies' supply line got longer. So it's a race to the next Road Junction, Spotsylvania. The Confederates beat them by 12 hours and immediately dug elaborate trenches. But Meade, when he arrived on Grant, ordered an attack. The Battle of Spotsylvania, the biggest battle will be on the 12th. By the way, what's the worst part about Spotsylvania? Spotsylvania. Vampires, yeah. Blood sucking vampires, correct? And what's the worst thing about vampires? They have no loyalty. Don't trust vampires. Well, to give you an idea how awful this battle would be, the first Union Corps to arrive, so about 12,000 men, the 6th Corps under General John Cedric, the men loved Cedric. Not a brilliant commander, but really cared for his men. They called him Uncle John. They really liked him. Cedric arrived and is known for his bravery. Confederate sharpshooters were taking pot shots at some of Sedgwick's staff. They were about 500 yards away. Now, black powder, muzzle loading rifle. How would you have to aim your rifle if you're shooting at 500 yards? Yeah, you're like this. You're like shooting a mortar around at you. So they're not right. There's shots hitting around. But some of Sedgwick's staff was kind of ducking and hiding behind their horses. And Sedgwick rode up and he just disgusted. And he said, you know, quit hiding. Men, they couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. They don't like it. Kill them instead. That gives you an idea how bloody this battle is going to be. So, the Confederates have built, oh, this is Sedgwick right there. So the Confederates had built these long trenches with this weird angle right here. They're all still there. You can walk these trenches. Then they're about five feet deep, and then they piled the dirt and put logs up. They called breastworks. Really elaborate trenches. And the Union forces tried to attack here in a few places. And it's really heavily forested. And they dug them so there's a clearing in front of the trenches. So any forces had to emerge into the clearing. Remember what happened at Gettysburg or Fredericksburg? Well. Did anyone get the map? I don't know if you can recreate this. So, that's Confederate Trench Line. Feel like you're in Spotsylvania now? Well, they had been attacking. They lined their regiments up like this and just marched at them. And it was slaughtered. A young major, Emory Upton, came up with an idea. Right here, there's about 50 yards of clearing between the forest and the Confederate lines. And he had about 400 men in his regiment. And he suggested, let's not line up parallel. Let me line up two lines in a column of 200 men each. Fix bayonets, don't even load their muskets. 
and they'll sneak right to the edge of the forest, quick bugle call, no preliminary bombardment. They just stand up, scream like maniacs, and charge the Confederate line. They get to the line, and they just clear out either way reinforcements can take them. Take them by shock. Because how fast can you run 50 yards? I can do it in about two seconds. How about you guys? And they roll the die and let him do it. And so they waited till mid-afternoon. And, well, the first thing they had to do is, Upton's right here in between them, two lines of 200 men. What do you have to find first? Two crazy volunteers to lead it. And you know what? Who would do it here? Yeah, there's always somebody. I'll do it. So they found a few nuts who led it. And they stood up and charged and took the Confederates by surprise. They were not ready at all. Maybe got one shot off. And in fact, ironically, the first guys in line, in fact, the first seven guys in each line, none of them were hit. They were so surprised. They got to the Confederate lines, cleared out about 100 feet, but no reinforcements came. Because no one thought it would work. So Major Upton became General Upton. He was promoted and given a brigade of 4,000 men. And their plan was now to have four lines of 1,000 men each. They would all charge like maniacs. These guys would clear out, and the other ones would go in the back of the line and just wreak havoc. And then an entire corps of over 10,000 men, they're going to do it right here, will follow through the opening, get behind the Confederate line. It's a good plan. This one, though, they have about 100 yards of clearing. You can go, you have a spot at the battlefield, right where Upton's charge was, and you can go there. And they waited, same deal, one o'clock. They did a couple of diversionary attacks, and then Upton's men charged. It was on the 12th. And same thing. The first four guys weren't hit, took them by surprise. They opened a hole, Union forces began pouring through. We personally led a counterattack, it looked like it was over. The only problem was the Corps under General Hancock, who was wounded in Gettysburg, they got lost up here. And for over an hour and a half, they could hear the fighting, yet they couldn't find it. They were about 200 yards away, just kind of marching in circles. And when they got there, Confederate forces had pushed them back that's the diorama there. They pushed them back to that trench line. And where that angle is, right there, it became known as Bloody Angle. And Bloody Angle, for the next 20 hours, they fought over this trench line. As both sides sent in reinforcements back and forth over these breastworks, they charge, countercharge. Bodies begin to pile up, dead and wounded men. And then it started to rain hard and it made that they fought all night and made this battle just a nightmare as pretty soon by dust you said both sides got kind of huddled on both sides of this mound and men behind would hand a loaded musket and kind of stand up and fire slash the bayonet and kind of throw the musket back wounded men would be would fall right where they lay more men would come and cover them up hundreds of men drowned in the mud caused by the rain in one 100-yard section in the 500 miles. At that spot, there was an oak tree. Now, oak is hard wood, and this is, it was cut in half. It was cut in half by bullets, not cannon, bullets. If you could cut an oak tree in half, think about what that would do to a human body. There's going to be over a thousand bodies they could not identify. They were just mangled flesh. Do you know what a dog tag is? That term would come out in World War II. Well, they didn't have anything like that in the Civil War, but this is why. World War I was so awful. That's where they started making soldiers wear dog tags so they could identify them when they're dead. Some would carry little labels or bracelets, but they couldn't find them. That's the tree. It's in the Smithsonian Museum of American History. And that's my picture. Here's my picture of it. I'll pass it around. And if you look at it, do you see little gray specks? Those are musket balls in it, huh? Oh, I bet it's ass. Those are the musket balls embedded in the tree. 
Now, my first time I took this picture, this was back, first time I was there, pre-digital camera. I had a 35 millimeter camera and it's kind of dark. And so you have to, when you use flash on a glass case, you have to get kind of an angle or you either see a big flash or you see a reflection. But 35 millimeter film, you had no idea what pitch, what your picture looked like because you got developed. That's one thing really nice about cameras now. You go, oh yeah, that's awful. Like, what? Well, good picture. So I snapped a picture, went back to be developed, and all it was was a flash and then a reflection of me taking a picture of me, taking a picture of me, taking a picture of me, taking a picture of me to infinity. When I went back again, I got that picture. 